All right, so we just finished taking care of my cousin's dog, Trudy, who, uh, that was my first time ever taking care of a dog or dog sitting. And I shouldn't say we, it was just me, unless you count myself and my multiple personalities, which uh, don't be alarmed. I don't have any extra personalities that I'm aware of yet. And I am 30, so I have hit the age where if it was going to reveal itself, it would have at this point. But anyways, that's besides the point. That was a nice little experience, taking care of Trudy. Very sweet dog, older dog. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what kind she is, but um, she was very cool to take care of. So I'm on my way home right now, and I am looking forward to dinner because I haven't eaten all day through no fault of anyone else but my own <laughs> because um, for whatever reason, I was born with the disposition to see food as more of an inconvenience than anything else because you know you have to set time aside to either cook food or get food it's an added expense and as someone who is currently technically unemployed um, you know food is just one more thing I have to take care of but it's something that I, ha I should be paying more attention to because my diet has a large effect on my ability to perform as a human being in regards to you know, getting my work done, doing projects, things like that. Oh man, I really need to clean my windshield. It is freaking gross right now. So I need to make food more of a priority. But the reason I'm so stoked is because I am about to have McDonald's, okay? And for those of you who watch my streams or watch my content, you know I am a McDonald's fanatic. I keep saying one day when I'm rich and famous, I will donate money to McDonald's. Do they need donations? No, absolutely not. But I'll do it because of simply how absurd that concept sounds. I just love McDonald's that much. I mean, I'm just kidding. I probably won't actually donate to McDonald's because you know they're contributing to the destruction of society as we know it in their own way, but that's a discussion for another time. I'm just excited to have some McDoubles, okay? I don't know, that was a very long-winded way of explaining it. And uh, yeah, I'm excited for a weekend of streaming as well because the schedule I have set currently is a little funky. I gave myself Tuesdays and Thursdays off. You might be asking, why would you separate the days you have off? Well, my logic for it was they weren't totally days off, their days off from streaming, so that way I could focus on making YouTube content rather than think about doing a broadcast for that, for that day. Because, you know, unlike a lot of streamers, I feel very confident saying this because there is uh, quite a stigma or a stereotype regarding streamers being lazy. Most of them are pretty lazy. Let's, let's be completely honest. I mean, even some of the big ones are kind of lazy which in a way makes me feel a little bit better. I think I might've been going too hard on the paint when it came to streaming. I was like, oh, every, every stream needs to be planned out like it's a freaking game show. And in reality, you don't have to do all that stuff. Um, as long as you have a decent idea, a goal that you wanna aim for, then what really matters at the end of the day is that people enjoy watching you. There's a reason that why when it, you have, Excuse me, there's a reason why whenever you watch a tutorial explaining how to set audio levels for a live stream, the first thing it explains is that you, the broadcaster, should be the loudest thing. Now, why is that? Why isn't it the game? Well, contrary to popular belief or the notion of how Twitch streaming works, people watch live streams because they want to get to know you as an individual. They could watch the gameplay anywhere. And maybe there is a unique way that you play the game that people are tuning in to see. But at the end of the day, it's kind of background noise to what's actually happening. It's kind of like sludge content, if you will. If you ever watch TikTok or YouTube Shorts or anything like that, you'll notice that they'll be playing some game like uh, Temple Run, I think it's called. That's what I used to play back in the day. I'm gonna make one of those one day and it'll be Bike Race, okay? For anyone, who played bike race on iOS in 2014, 2015. I'm gonna make sludge content with bike race, which, funny story, I used to work at a job 
where it was my sole mission to convince everyone in the office to start playing bike race so that I could destroy them in the, uh, in the times, the, the racing comparisons. And there was one holdout. And if you're watching this, you know who you are. I could never convince him to play bike race. And, and I don't know why to this day. It was almost like a religious obligation to not play bike race. So I just I never got to him. And um, technically he won because I don't play either. Anyways, that's besides the point. Sludge content, shorts that you know usually have a meaningful me a message or a story to tell, but because people's ex attention spans are so short, they have to add a, another piece of content on top of it so that they can stay focused on what's actually being said. And don't even get me started about having to add captions on every single short form video. I mean, it is kind of understandable because a lot of people do watch shorts with the audio turned off, but you know, it is just one more factor that allows for retention. And it makes me very curious what that will look like in the future as far as how people are able to digest information. I was talking about this in an earlier recording about how when you go to college, you only retain 30% of the information that you're taught and to me that was kind of inefficient from the standpoint of a professor because putting together a lesson plan is a ton of work it is not just uh, you know it, it might not be so bad that students are only getting 30% because if that is a valuable if 100% is valuable then 30 is worth it right but that seems like a lot of extra effort and manpower to put together if you're only retaining that much so, you know, a hot take. Maybe not so much in 2024, but I feel like I have actually learned more information listening to podcasts than I have from going to college necessarily. Now, granted, that's not an apples to apples comparison because there are certain experiences you get when you go to college that you can't get, obviously, listening to audio in your car. And some of those things include being able to network and connect with like-minded people in your field if it is a field that you end up sticking with long term you know for me it's partially debatable because you know i studied theater and filmmaking and I'll, I'll tell you right now i hardly know any filmmakers in fact i actually know less filmmakers because we worked together and then we ended up not working together down the line uh, but actors uh, kind of stay in contact with. For the series that I produced, there uh, are two actors who I met in school and it's nice to be able to work with them because, believe it or not, trying to audition people in LA is insanely hard. You would think that people would be dying for any role that they could get their hands on to do in a film, but no, no, no way. It's just one person after the other who is flaky, doesn't want to commit to the job, doesn't respond to messages. When we were doing the first episode, we actually had an actress who submitted her measurements, and then on the day of the shoot, no response, no show, and I had to find someone else who, thankfully, I'd gone to school with to do that production. So, yeah, it's, doing auditions is not as uh, straightforward as you might think. But anyways, back to the, the college notion and the podcast and all that stuff. I have to say podcasts are the most useful form of education I think I've ever come across, mainly because I can actually rewind and stop the podcast, I can take in the information, it's not just going, 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 and whatever I miss, I miss. And I don't have to take notes either, like the notes are there, I can go back and listen to it. And it's especially good when you live in a place like Los Angeles because you know, there's so many times where you're stopping in traffic and it takes you two hours to get to a destination. A lot of people complain about how long it actually takes to travel in LA, but I think it's, it's a bit of a blessing because all that downtime can be used in such uh, a useful way. I mean, it doesn't even have to be a useful way. You could throw on a Spotify playlist, like the one that I have on stream that people add to, or the, the viewers add to, I just jam out to that when I don't feel like listening to something. But, you know, it is a different experience doing this sort of format, recording video, 
when you live in a major city, obviously this whole thing is inspired by Sam Sulek's content and his journey as a bodybuilder. But my perception in the few times I've watched his videos that he lives someplace where there's less traffic, like it's a little bit more rural. I could be totally wrong. That's just what it looks like when I watch. So we are almost home, about, I'd say five minutes away. It's always quicker getting home than it is getting anywhere in LA, which is unfortunate because usually you need to get somewhere on time and not home, unless you've got a crazy spouse to get back to. Now that's a different story. <laughs> that seems to be the common theme whenever I go to a paintball practice, is that there is always a significant other who keeps you on a very strict time schedule. And if you deviate, which, you know, husband always seems to deviate no matter what, uh, they are not happy. And you end up hearing a cursing storm as we're wrapping up practice because they completely overstayed the amount of time they said they, to their significant other they were going to. So, but, you know, for me, it's getting to the destination that is usually the more challenging part. Like, for example, yesterday, my best friend's daughter was performing in uh, at a coffee shop. She was singing, which I'm very proud of her, by the way. She did a fantastic job. Also, another side story with that. I'll get to it in a second. But anyways, this place is in Chatsworth, which is, you know, two hours from Long Beach. Well, it ended up being two hours from Long Beach. My GPS originally said an hour and 30 minutes, but the longer the distance, the more you have to compensate for changes in time and things like that because, you know, with the accidents, I was just in standstill traffic for most of that time. Um, but the other thing I was going to say was, it is insane to me how high the bar has been set for artists. I don't know if that's just in LA in general because it attracts all of them or because, you know, generation after generation just gets better at things faster. I feel like the same rule applies to Amy as well. But I'm at this coffee shop and I'm listening to my friend's daughter sing. And she does a great job. She has good presence. And she uh, is seemingly, like, it's crazy how she's not that nervous. Because I've been acting, performing for years. And it still, like, gets me quaking in my boots. But she's just chilling up there. I'm like, okay, good for her. That's fantastic. And then there are other people going up there doing stand-up, uh, rappers, there's a pop star, there's a girl who had been doing guitar and singing for a year. It sounded like she'd been doing it for 10. It's just unbelievable how many hidden gems of talent there are in this town, which uh, brings me to another point of how freaking hard it is to make it. And you know, your talent is not necessarily the defining factor of what gets you to that point anyway because there's so many things that, that come into play. And I'll tell you from personal experience, you know, the biggest gig I ever worked on was a movie in Brazil. And, you know, the ironic part was I didn't really have to do any work to get in the movie, but every other gig I did leading up to that point was fought for tooth and nail, you know, with auditions and, um, you know, trying to stay in contact with directors, producers, things like that, so I could work on projects in the future. What I didn't realize was that a lot of it didn't so much have to do with your talent per se. It was more so submitting your lottery ticket, like getting in the room as often as possible in order to find the room that was the right fit for you. So what I mean by that is you could be an insanely good actor, book a bunch of jobs, but most of those jobs don't end up leading to anything else because the people behind them aren't actually working on anything beyond that. They might be just doing a student project or it's a one-off sort of deal. And I'm kind of guilty of this because, you know, I had a fantastic actress who worked on um, the last, well, the whole crew was fantastic, to be honest, with the stuff I put them through, honestly. And the project still isn't done. I, I plan on getting to it, but it could be when I'm 60 at this rate. But anyways, you gotta keep showing up until you end up in the project that is going to lead to more opportunities down the line. And that usually means meeting someone who you vibe with really well. You know, a, a producer that you vibe with. It's like, hey, you know, you and I are the same, are on the same track for making stuff happen. 
And um, I realize you guys can't see me now, but that's okay. I'm going to wrap up here in a second. Anyway, we're on the same track. So I want you to, you know, go on this journey with me. And if you can find someone like that, treasure that because that is rarer than you think. The more auditions you go on, the rarer you'll realize it is. Unless it's the first person you meet, then, you know, you just won the lottery. But um, I hope you guys enjoyed that 15 minute rant and uh, I'll see you in another video. This is the first time I'm doing a, a car vlog. So hope you enjoy. Peace out. Take care.